wonderful. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. The cross is spoken, mercy over me. Now I can see the weary's hurt, my heart to fully know. The glory of His seen you yet. We've only seen you through eyes of faith, through your word. But one day, Lord, one day, face to face, and Lord, one day, we want to hear you look at us face to face and say, well done, good and faithful servant, Lord. So Lord, we pray that you would prepare our hearts tonight for what you'd have for us in your word, that your word would equip us for every good work so that we may be about your business till you come, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You are Lord, you are Lord, our creation will proclaim, you 
nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reigns. My heart will sing. My heart will sing. No other name. Jesus. Jesus. My heart will sing. No other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, and go. This next song, I just, uh, Lord David asked the question, who am I? What is man that you are mindful of him? And a son of man that you would visit him. And Lord, when I think of you, you, you forever reign over this universe. The earth is your footstool. Lord, the lives of human beings is me measured by vapor. Lord, and to think that you would call us the apple of your eye, that we are your son or daughter, we are a royal priesthood, a special people. Lord, I just don't get used to that. I just don't get used to the fact that every single one of us matters to you, that you would send your son for us. Oh, Lord, thank you. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, who care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am. But because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind still you. Hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you've told me who I am. I am yours, I am yours. Who am I? Who am I? That the eyes that see my sin 
would look on me with love and watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. A vapor in the wind Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you told me who I am I am I am a flower quickly fading Here today and gone tomorrow A wave tossed in the ocean a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm falling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I am You've said that you have lost none. None of us will ever be lost out of your hand. No matter what. No matter how dumb we can be, your grace is much greater. And your love and your mercy and your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing love. Let's all stand. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for?
we go through Proverbs and we're going to come to one of those tonight that Solomon put pen to paper under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it's going to explain to us the joy, the peace, the satisfaction, the contentment, Lord, that only comes as we're in relationship with you. Uh, there's something about it that transcends everything else. Uh, and it just removes all fear, all worry, all doubt. It brings to us a confidence and a stability like nothing else, Lord. And the joy and the peace, you know, it's, it is. It's exactly what the Word said it is. It's indescribable. It's unexplainable. And Lord, even in these tumultuous times that we're going through, we, we're enjoying such great peace. And Lord, we're just looking up because we expect you to come back any moment. We want to pray tonight for uh, the couples that went over to be counselors, Lord, and for our youth and our youth pastor, Joey. Uh, Lord, as they're there in Bodega Bay, tomorrow they come home. It's their last day of the summer retreat. And Lord, we've been praying. We've been meeting here on Monday in our prayer meeting. We've been praying uh, in different times in different places with different people, Lord. We've been asking that your Holy Spirit would get a hold of the hearts of our, of our teenagers, Lord, as they're on retreat, Lord. And, and Father, we, we can't wait to hear the stories uh, of what you have done when they come back. So again, tonight, Father, it's their last night there, Lord. We just pray that as they're worshiping you, Lord, and as the word goes forth, that, Lord, it would penetrate their hearts, that they would have a genuine Holy Spirit-filled experience, Lord, with you, we ask that tonight. And then for every other need we have represented here this evening, Lord, we lift those things to you. You know, we are praying for Gary's recovering from surgery, Lord. We want to pray for Susan having some difficulties in her physical body. I just want to pray for, for Lori and for Ginger recovering from their knee surgeries. You know, Lord, you need to come soon. We're falling apart over here. And uh, we need those new bodies. So, And we just lift all of those, all the people that are home that are high risk, those that are sick, Lord, we lift them before you. We thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you tonight that Sherry Mirinbich, Mirinsich, I always pronounce her name wrong, is healed. That you, in stage four cancer, miraculously removed it all. The doctors can't find it. We thank you for that as we've been praying for her interceding, Lord, on Mondays when we're down here with the group just praying. And Lord, thank you for answering that prayer. And before that, thank you for answering the prayer that we prayed for Beverly, Max's sister. Same story. They can't find any cancer. The spots are there to prove that it was there. And they don't know what to think. Lord, we do. You're a good God. You know where we live. You know what we need. And so, Lord, we just continue to lift our needs to you this evening. And we do so in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, Amen. We'll spend a few moments greeting one another before you settle into your spot this evening. So, hey, let's turn in our Bibles. We've come as far as Proverbs chapter 17. 
And we finished last week verse 20, so we'll pick up in verse 21. And boy, is this verse not appropriate for what's going on in our world today. So let's pray and we'll just dive right into our study this evening. Father, again, we thank you for the work of your Spirit in our hearts. We thank you that the Holy Spirit has made Jesus ever so real to us. That we are not religious, we have entered into a wonderful, intimate, completely satisfying relationship with the one who made us. And Lord, just the, the manifestation of the relationship in our hearts and our lives is hope and peace. And we thank you for that. I was talking to one of the sisters here in the fellowship just before the service about the hope and the peace that you brought. And she was talking about before she was saved, I was talking about before I was saved. And Lord, we're so glad we can talk about before we were saved. Because now we are. And we're so looking forward to that Mary Supper of the Lamb. In fact, Lord, I can just almost hear the dinner bell ring. Time to come home. And so, Lord, as we look at these things, help us to apply these things to our lives. We don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to be doers. And we know that it takes that strength of the Holy Spirit to do it. So, Father, just pour it out upon us, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we would ask. And again, all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Listen carefully as we come now to chapter 17, uh, verse uh, 21. Listen carefully. He that begatteth a fool doth to his own sorrow, and a father of a fool hath no joy. Look at our culture today. I think there are a lot of people begatting a lot of fools. And I'm using that as the biblical term. I'm not, listen, this is not me in any ways making any accusations. I'm just saying that our culture is acting very foolishly to think that the wisest thing to do would be to defund the police department and get rid of law enforcement and just have no rules or no laws, just have total anarchy. Um, you know, we're looking around and we're seeing the benefit of what we've been, what we've been sowing in our, in our society. Um, we're living in a time where from the 60s, those people grew up, same time I lived, and they begat children that they raised in a humanistic, anti-God kind of a way, and then they begat children that we're seeing now today on the streets of Portland, Oregon, and in the streets of Seattle, Washington, and all across our nation, just absolutely trying to destroy this country. He, uh, and again, listen carefully. And I've done the, the research, and Barna's research says that over 90% of every person in prison today is there for a violent crime, whether it be murder or rape, armed robbery, um, what, assault. 90% of people that are in prisons today are uh, for violent crimes uh, were, were raised in a home where there was no father, uh, there was no influence. Um, but we've come for generations now without a godly influence. And so it's so important, and I just want for those that you are fathers to listen very carefully to what Solomon, who was a father to his son Jeroboam, as he's trying to bring him up, listen very carefully what he says here, he that begatteth a fool. Now, you have a responsibility, I have a responsibility. And, you know, my son to this day, he, he calls me a couple times a week. We speak for hours at a time. And one of the things he was sharing, because he's now the youth pastor at the First, Chey First Baptist uh, Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming, you know, he was sharing with some of the kids the influence I had on him. From a young age, we would talk doctrine. We would talk about the Lord. We would talk about the rapture. We'd go on long drives and rides. And we had an old Land Cruiser, got a map, and we'd just go up in the mountains and camp. And I spent a lot of time discipling my son. Listen, to raise somebody that grows up to be mature, God-fearing, godly young man is work. Uh, if you don't work at it, you can beget a fool. God wants us to beget wise young men and daughters as we raise them up in the faith. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, we have some instruction concerning um, how to raise up a young man in the faith if you're a father. First, the commandment comes to the child. And it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. I'm glad it says in the Lord because when I got saved, my dad wasn't saved. And some of the things he asked me to do were not godly. They weren't the Lord leading. And, and I didn't have to obey him. I had to respect him. And I had to be respectful toward him. But I didn't have to obey him because at that moment, my heavenly father, uh, that was the final authority in my life. 
But children, you should obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This, this will be good for you if you'll do this. I, I wish our youth group was here tonight. They need to hear this. In fact, maybe I'll have Pastor Joy make them listen to this when they get back. Um, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. And by the way, it doesn't say till you're 18 years old. Does it say that? I can't tell you how many kids I've had up in my office. When I'm 18, like that's the magic number. Like all of a sudden when you turn 18, you're all wise. You have it all figured out. You know, I remember when I was 18, I had this wonderful thought. I looked at my dad one day and I said, that is the stupidest man on the planet. Guy doesn't know anything. Man, he's just, he's, he's, he's trapped in time. You know, he just, he, he's not with it. He doesn't understand the times. But when I was 23 years old, I looked at my dad and I thought, wow. And the things he told me. How smart he got in those few years. It was amazing. <laughs> You'll get that on the way home. Honor your father and your mother. Give them honor. Which is the first commandment when you go through the Ten Commandments that has a promise built into it. That if you do that, it goes on to say that it will be well with thee and you will live long on the earth. And every time I read that, I think of Spock. You'll live long and prosper. And the whole idea is if, if you don't honor your mom and dad, listen, they brought you in, they'll take you out. So you're not going to live long. But if you will honor your mother and father, all kidding aside, listen, listen to what they say. They're wise. They've walked the path ahead of you. They understand things. We're seeing a generation that doesn't want to listen to anybody um, that's older. They don't want to respect their elders. They think they have the right to disrespect their elders. And then it says the responsibility for the child to be like this, for a child to obey their parents in the Lord because it's the right thing to do, to honor their mother and father. Listen, that starts at a very young age. And it is the responsibility of the father to do that. Listen to what it says in the next verse. It says this, and you fathers. Now, when you look at this in the Greek, it's a very interesting um, section of Scripture because it really starts back up in chapter 5, verse 17, when it says, don't be drunk with wine, which is to excess, but be being filled with the Spirit of God. And the verse before that says that we should know the will of God. Well, there's two imperatives there. Know the will of God, and don't be intoxicated with the world, but be filled with the Spirit. Then it's followed those two imperatives by four participles, which tells you what that looks like. And then it's six definite articles. Wives, husbands. Then it'll talk about children and fathers. And then it'll talk about employees and employers, or slaves and masters, as it were in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it would apply to employees and employers, how we ought to conduct ourselves in that relationship with somebody in a position of authority over you and somebody under a position of authority. But when it comes to the fathers, it says this, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Um, you know, I see this even in the Christendom. I see this even in the church where, it, it, as it were, it would seem that a father just does not care for his sons or for his daughters. It's almost like they're, they're a distraction to him. They're a burden to him. He doesn't have time for them. Listen, wake up. You are responsible and will be responsible someday before the Lord when we stand there and we give an account for our life for how you disciplined and discipled your sons and your daughters. It will be the father that stands before the Lord, not the mother. Now you can delegate what you need to delegate. But you as a father will stand before the Lord and you're going to give an account for your sons and for your daughters. I'm going to tell you, when Destiny was born, I was in a hospital. It felt like a weight just rested on my shoulders when she came out of the womb. And, and I looked at her and, you know, then they wanted me to cut the cord. And I just, man, I just, I, nah, I was going to pass it. But I, I okay, I'll, whatever, um, turn my head. You know, I could still feel what it felt like for the scissors to go through that. Ugh. And, but then I told the nurse, because they wanted to take her away. I said, no, you wrap her up. Well, we got to, I said, you don't need to clean her up. Just wrap her up and hand her to me. Because I had read one of the articles that James Dobson back in the day on Focus on the Family had put out that 
the baby bonds to the mom in the womb because he hears the voice constantly. But the first half hour out of the womb, it bonds to the father. And so I just took Destiny and I took all my, the only one I couldn't do it to was Charity because it was C-section and they wouldn't let me in the operating room. But I took every one of my children and for the next half hour, I prayed over them. I told them how special they are, how they were to serve the Lord. And then I just committed to them to be the father that I, I need to be. And, and, you know, we just walked around the hospital and me just praying over them. You know, and my kids are in ministry today. Um, and, but I'm going to tell you, a weight landed on me, a responsibility, a mantle, if you will. And I just had to ask, Lord, I, I, know, I, don't, know what I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. But you're my heavenly father and you'll teach me how to be a good earthly father. And I expect you to do that. And I remember when they all turned teenagers, every one of them, even my son, we took them out to a very special dinner. They got to choose the place. And we gave them a ring, a purity ring, and we gave them a contract. And we read the contract. They signed it. We signed it. And then I gave my speech. You guys want to know what my speech is? Well, I'll give you the reader's diver you know, version of my speech. My speech simply was, is between now and the time you get married, there are going to be times you're not going to like me. In fact, there are going to be times that you're going to hate me. In fact, there are going to be times you're going to think that I am so out of it and so outdated and just not with it. But that's okay. I'm willing to risk you not liking me to get you safely on, on the other side of this thing. So wh whether you like me or not, this is my speech, said it to every one of my children, I'm going to love you. And I'm going to love you in truth. And I'm going to protect you. Our kids never dated. They courted. They courted when it got to the age where they could get married and was always with supervision. Never alone. I remember Destiny was the first one out of the shoot. She came to me one day. She goes, Dad, come on. You know, Doug and I would just like to talk without you and Mom and, and, and all the rest of the people sitting in the same room. And I said, that's fine. You can do that. She goes, Really? She goes, well, we would like to go out to dinner together. And I said, you can, right there on the back porch. Just move the table right out. And listen, this is a true story. Kyle and I are sitting on the couch looking. at. We have three big plate windows. They're out there having dinner. She's got all the candlelight and everything. And, and all her other siblings are sitting over here and we're watching. Now, we can't hear, but we're watching. And Doug looks over at me and I went like this. You know, dude. And when Doug came to me and asked, for Destiny's hand in marriage, that he could start courting her. I did a very wise thing. We were down in San Francisco getting our uh, passports because we were going to Africa for the first time in 1999 to start the work in Africa. We were going to leave Doug there for a year. And then we we're going to come back in two, 2000 and pick him up as we look for the place where we're going to plant the church and do the work. And... So I'm mulling this over because he's asked me as we went to San Francisco if he can court my daughter when he gets back. And I'm thinking, because we had to wait for the passports. It was one of those things. And so we went to Pier 39 and we're walking around the pier and, and you know, Kyle is lingering too long for me in some kind of girly shop that I didn't want to be in. So I found a knife store and I scurry over to the knife store and in the knife store they had bullet keychains. And the thought hit me. Okay, I'm buying that for Doug. And so when everybody's gathered together, I said, Doug, when you get back, if you do well in Africa, you may court my daughter, but let me give you a gift. And I gave him this bullet on a keychain. He goes, what's that for? And I said, if you emotionally, physically, spiritually, or in any way harm my daughter, the next bullet I give you is going to be coming a whole lot faster. Do you understand? That's my daughter. And I care about her. I don't know you yet. And I got wonderful son-in-laws. Give every one of them. Ben, his brother, who married the next one down, because he's six foot four, I didn't give him a 45, I gave him a 30 odd six. He's a bigger guy, might take a little more to take him down. But listen, I care about my children. And you know, almost all of them have come back, at least three out of the four have come back and said, Dad, we know how hard it was now, because we have kids for you to do what you did, but we appreciate it. We appreciate the time, the protection, the energy the commitment that you made. And, Lord, and, and, and you know, we, we know we push back. Kids will. Rebellion is bound in the heart of the child. It's the rod of correction that drives it out. 
But here, the father is not to provoke the children to wrath. You are not to break the spirit of the child. You're to break the will to sin in the child. And so, so many fathers, I see them discipline and anger. Um, you know, I had a conversation with my son the other day, and there's only two times that, that I really, and I never disciplined him. Well, I, one time I did, and one time I didn't, that I did in anger, and I told you about it, and I had to apologize. I never laid hands on him when I was angry, but, but showed my displeasure in a way that I shouldn't have. And we've talked about those things, but don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture. That's an interesting word in the Greek. That word for nurture is the same word to, to, to be an example. Uh, it, I don't know if I want to give you the, any more clarity. Than, well, I will. I'll give you some more clarity. It, it's the same word used for a mom who nurses her child. The father is to be that kind of nurturing because he's feeding his children the pure milk of the world. The Word of God. He's pouring that into their lives. He's, he has to be open. He has to be transparent. He has to express passionately as he's feeding them the pure milk of God's Word that it would impact them, that, it would, that, that, it, that they could receive it. And then the word for admonition has the idea of teaching. It has the idea of training. It has the idea of taking the Word of God and disciplining with the Word of God. And um, so... That's what a father is to do. So when we read these, these Proverbs, especially this particular one here in verse 21, he says, he that begatteth the fool. Because you either, you're called to begat wise, godly children, godly offspring. Um, because they're God's heritage. They actually belong to the Lord. And he's seeking such. That's what Malachi tells us. But you can also begat a fool if you are foolish as a father. And if you do begat a fool, it will bring you sorrow. Sorrow is going to come down the pike for you. But then he says, and the father of a fool, he'll have no joy. There'll be no joy about having a child like that. So while they're young, while they're impressionable, you train up that child in the way that it should go. And when it grows old, you know, there's that time where they can, we were praying Monday morning for the prodigals in our fellowship and for the people who have prodigals. But when they grow old, they won't depart. You, they will come back because the word of God will not return void. But fathers, I challenge you. And here, Solomon, who, who is a father, um, who had a father, King David, who understands that special relationship, was saying, listen, you need to be careful how you raise up your children. You fathers are responsible for this, and you have to be careful not to begat a fool. Now, the beautiful thing is, is if, if you do that with your children, then you get the wonderful privilege of hanging out with your grandkids. And, uh, and that's even a more, more, how many are grandparents? That's even a more blessed experience, because then you can, you can pour into them, and, and you know, and they love grandma and grandma's house. They fight our kids, they rotate. Once a week, we, we bring one over. We used to bring them all over. It's too much. We bring one at a time now so we can spend time with just that one. And, and I'll tell you, they're, they're in an argument. You did it last week. No, I didn't. That wasn't really my turn. I just, mama had to go out of town and I had to go be, like I had to go be with grandma and grandpa. But that wasn't my turn. I still get my, I mean, it's wonderful to hear your grandkids argue over who gets to come to grandma's house and grandpa. Um, actually, they like me better than grandma. No, they do. This is true. This is true, because grandma doesn't let them get away with anything. I slip them candy. I bribe them. Listen carefully. He that begatteth the fool doth it to his sorrow. And the father of a fool hath no joy. Now, the beautiful thing of this is if, you, if you've not been engaged with your children the way the Bible describes that you should be engaged as fathers with your children, you can repent tonight and you can change. You can say, Lord, um, and it doesn't even matter if they're grown. You can say, Lord, I messed up. Um, give me another opportunity. You know he will. Uh, verse 22, and I love this one. You know, Kyle and I, we used to like to watch 
it's off the air now. How, how many ever watched that, um, the show where it's, they're laughing all the time because uh, people are falling down and doing all, um, oh man, it's, funniest videos, America's funniest videos. We used to sit sometimes and just watch those things and, and laugh until we just could not, we couldn't stand it because it's good for you to laugh. Did you know that? Here's what the Bible says. A merry heart. And, you know, <laughs> and sometimes, man, some of those things are just funny. A merry heart doth good like a medicine. It's good to laugh. Because he goes on to say, but a broken spirit. Um, it trieth up the bones. Broken spirit. Uh, David knew a lot about this um, when he had sinned. Um, you remember when he writes in Psalms 42 and again in 44 that he just dried up. Uh, he was on his bed like a hinge. There was no rest. Uh, his eyes were dry. There were no more tears. There was just something until he repented. You know, one of the things we were studying through when we started our introduction in 2 Corinthians, that God wants us to experience peace. He wants us to experience joy. He wants us to have hope. Uh, he wants us to, you know, He really wants us to be blessed. The thing that keeps us from that is our stubbornness, our pride, and our, our lack of willingness to, to repent. But, but what we need to know is that what God really wants us to do is have a merry heart. Let, let me give you a few verses that, that prove this point. And I'm, I'm going to walk through it like a little pearl, a chain of pearls with several verses here. But what I want to prove is a point. But the point I want to prove is that what God wants you and I to experience as his sons and his daughters is joy and peace. Absolute contentment. Um, he wants us to rest in Him. He wants our hearts to be filled with joy, peace, contentment, satisfaction. He wants to bless us. That's the heart of our Father. That's the heart of any good Father. Wants to bless His children. And so it tells us here in Psalms chapter 32 in the first four verses, listen carefully, because... The, there, there is a, um, there's a truth in this as we unpack it tonight, and I want you to listen to it, because if you're here tonight and you're experiencing depression, now I'm not talking about spiritual warfare or oppression from the wicked one. We're all going to battle that, because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and a host of evil wickedness in high places, and man, are we not in the middle of it right now. We're in the fray of it. But even in the fray of this great spiritual battle that's going on around us, and as we have our armor on and our shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, and we're praying with all prayer and supplication for all the saints, as we're in this battle, listen, true joy is not related to circumstances. Happiness is related to circumstances. And by the way, God doesn't want you just to be happy because circumstances change. You know, I've told you before, I use this analogy that, you know, I could blow the dust off my Shelby and, and wash it up and wax it, start it up and we'll take it for a drive. And I would be extremely happy. I haven't done it for a few years, but if I did, I would be extremely happy. Until, you know, me messing with all the knobs and being distracted, I miss the stop sign and somebody plows into it and then my happiness would turn to extreme depression. God is not interested in you being happy. God is interested in you having peace and joy because peace and joy is related to Him, not to circumstances. Circumstances can come and go. You can be in the middle of a great spiritual battle and enjoy absolute peace. And here's how you do that. In Psalms 32, the first four verses, it says, Blessed... Now, we know that in Hebrew that means, oh, how happy, but it's not just, oh, how happy. It means somebody who is completely blessed of the Lord. The blessings are coming from the Lord. He's in the right relationship with the Lord, so those blessings can come from the Lord. He's just a blessed man. I can't tell you, I was up Thursday night in the mountains just praying, and, and you know, you, I 
flipped open my camper on Friday morning and I'm doing my devotions and my phone was right there. And I took a picture and all you guys lit up. And I won't even tell you what this new spot is. I told them where the last spot was and all of a sudden people started showing up. I got a new spot. And I ain't telling nobody where it's at. Beautiful spot. 7,033 feet according to my phone and it's uh, elevation app that I have. And I can see from California, I better not say any more. You guys will figure it out. Uh, from here all the way out to Nevada, just beautiful. Deer everywhere. Bear tracks. Maybe I'll get a picture of a bear. Beautiful place. And I'm just there. And it just seems like when I'm there alone with the Lord, every worry, every concern, uh, all just goes away. And there's a peace that just comes. And I, I was telling one of our sisters, I did a couple things. And man, if you ever camp near me, please don't wrap me out. But I just, I got, it got overwhelmed. And I just yelled out of my camper, I'm a blessed man. God, you have blessed me. And, and, the, and the tears just began to flow. I'm blessed. I'm blessed of the Lord. I'm saved, and I'm blessed of the Lord. I'm filled with the spirit of the living God, and I'm blessed. And I just started screaming. it. I'm, I'm pretty sure all the deer left after that. And so then, you know, and it's a beautiful day. So I take my chair on. I set it up, and I finish my studies with my coffee outside, and, and it just hit me. I needed to worship. And I stood up, put my coffee cup down, and I began to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune, and boy, did I pick the right song because he was tuning my heart, but he wasn't tuning my voice. And I'm screaming it at the top of my lungs. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Blessed. Blessed. Listen carefully. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. I'm forgiven. Whose sins are forgiven covered. And ours aren't just covered. That's Old Testament. Ours are removed. In fact, he won't even write anything new down. In fact, he says, your sins and your iniquities he remembers no more. Man, that's something to worship about. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. He won't write it down on your account anymore. And in whose spirit, now he's talking about the man, in whose spirit there is no guile. You want to enjoy blessing and peace? Have a spirit in whom there is no guile. You have integrity. You know what integrity is? Integrity is a new... It's actually uh, the word borrowed from the Greek for integrity in the Bible comes from the lowest denomination that cannot be divided. It's a mathematical term. It means it's one. It's not duplistic. It's not hypocritical. Now, from time to time, you and I can be duplistic. Did you know that? Because we have the spirit man and the flesh man, and sometimes you listen to the flesh man instead of the spirit man, and you mess up, and, and then you have to repent so you can have integrity again. That's just the relationship we have in this life. That's why he tells us in 1 John, if we say we have not a bent to sin, we lie and do not the truth. But if we confess our sins, he's just and faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we, if we say... We don't sin, then again, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. And then he goes right into chapter 2 and he says, My little born again ones, listen, I write unto you that you sin not. That should be the standard. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous. Listen, and he ever lives to make intercession for you. He is the propitiation for your sin. We all struggle through that part. It's called the great struggle of Romans chapter 7. But hypocrisy is something else. Hypocrisy is when you walk into church with a mask on and you're play acting. You're pretending to be something that you're not. In fact, you're pretending to be something you don't even have a desire to be. But you want people to think you are. And I'm going to tell you, when, when there is that cognizant dissidence, that's what it is. When you're claiming to be one thing or holding a standard of truth of one thing and doing something different, there, what that creates, that cognitive dissidence, what it creates in your life is turmoil. It creates confusion in every evil work. And there's no peace about it. If you, if you see a Christian, unless you know they're struggling through the loss of a loved one or some tragedy that's happened, but even that, there's still peace. The peace of God. Then 
we should challenge each other. Man, what are you doing that's brought this depression into your life? Because that's, what not, that's not what the Lord wants for you. Now listen as we walk through this. In whom there, there, there is no spirit of God. That means there's no hypocrisy in their life. Hey man, they have integrity. And when they become duplistic, they repent very quickly. They get back into the place of integrity. They get back into the place where God can bless them. Now listen to what he says as we move into the next verse. David said, and this is, this is a psalm of David. David said, when I kept silent. Uh, no doubt this was the time that he sinned against the Lord by committing adultery with Bathsheba. To cover his sin, because he didn't repent of it, he tried to cover his He tried to hide it. You remember he sent out to battle uh, with his generals and said, send Uriah back. And when Uriah came, he tried to deceive Uriah, tried to get Uriah to go and sleep with his wife so he could blame the child on his wife because he found out that you know, Bathsheba was pregnant. And Uriah was too much of an Arnold man to do that. He wouldn't do it. Got him drunk, tried to get him to do that, tried to persuade him when he wouldn't. He sent him to battle with a, with a letter in his hand to put him in the front line and back away. He murdered Uriah. And then he takes Bathsheba to be his wife and begins to act like he's all that and some more. And people say, man, look at King David. One of his great men of, of, of valor gets killed in the battlefield and he takes his pregnant wife to be his own. Isn't he a great guy? David knows inside, none of it's true. None of it's true. And for two years, he says, I'm like a hinge on my bed, back and forth. No sleep. I've dried up. Like, I'm just as dry as dry can be, like something that's in the summer sun. I just, there's no peace in my life. There's no joy. Uh, in fact, I'm so dead emotionally, there are no tears in my eyes. There's nothing. I'm, I'm a dead man walking. I'm depressed. I can't sleep. I'm discouraged. That's what happens when you are living a life of sin, habitually practicing something you shouldn't be practicing, and you're not repenting. David said, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Just for... And I hope none of you have ever experienced any of this. So I'm having to explain it to you. For day and night my hand, day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. Listen, God doesn't let you go when you're in the dregs of sin. Man, he just amps up the discipline. Did you know? Man, he said, it felt like your hand was on me, heavy. The moisture is turned into the drought of summer. There's nothing more in me. And, and I will tell you, that's not what God has for you. How stubborn some of us Christians can be. How we've refused to turn and to repent and to let go of that thing. And listen, we think that we can't have happiness with, without hanging on to that thing. And, and the Lord, as it were, is trying to pry your white knuckles away from that thing because he wants to bless you. You, you want to hang on to happiness. He wants to give you peace and joy. You want to hang on to your sin. He wants to give you, listen, the clarity and the purity uh, and, and the wholeness and the healthiness and the integrity of walking in holiness. That's why holiness is the first doctrine we study here. That's why it's the most important one because everything else flows from that. Now listen carefully to Psalms 1611. David had to learn this. Thou wilt show me the path of life. And he does. He is. Listen, you can't sin unless the Holy Spirit convicts you. We're, we're told that. Jesus said, when I send you the paracletus, the comforter, he comes to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment is to come. He'll lead and guide you into all truth. And then he says this, in thy presence. Listen carefully, saints. Listen, guys and gals. Listen, gang. In thy presence. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. It's the joy that he said that's inexpressible. It's the kind of joy that when you're out there all by yourself, all of a sudden something takes over and you're in your little camper, you're sitting there in your chair, you got your coffee sitting on this side, you got your Bible in front of you, you just start screaming, I'm blessed. I'm blood-bought and blood-washed. I'm spirit-filled. I'm on my way to heaven. 
I don't know if there was a Bigfoot or a bear or a deer or a raccoon or what, but they all left because they said, that guy over there, that camper's crazy. Then I got out of the camper, and at the top of my lungs, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy, never ceasing. In thy presence. You know, and I was thinking, man, if the congregation saw me, they never listened to me again. And you know what I thought about? I thought about David and his wife, Michael. You remember when he was dancing before the Lord and he came home that night and his wife said, oh, you, you showed yourself to be something today. How honorable was the king? Look, look at you. She was barren for the rest of her life. But he said, I will yet become more undignified in my worship of the Lord, because he is worthy of it. Some of you ought to let go a little bit sometime. Listen, there's enough what blankets in this church to put you out if you get too carried away. You just need to let go. Go up to the mountain, man, and just scream at the top of your lungs, I'm blessed! Now we're losing satellite churches, I know, right now, because they think, man, he's lost his mind. No, I'm blessed. Listen carefully. Very important point. Because he says this, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand, when you're as close as you can get to that power of the Holy Spirit, the right hand of, of God, there are pleasures evermore. There's nothing of this world that could ever satisfy you, and by its nature, it cannot satisfy you. Sin can never be satisfied. Did you, have you figured it out, Christian? You can never satisfy what needs to be satisfied in your heart through sin. Sin cannot do it. It won't do it. You can pour all the alcohol down your throat, pop all the pills, have all the sexual relationships. You can do whatever you want to do. It will never... I tried it for the first 21 years of my life. It doesn't work. And I would like to tell you, I found the secret, but I did. It found me. Cold, dark, rainy night. Gave my life to Jesus. And the first thing I experienced was peace for the first time in 21 years. And the second thing I experienced was hope for the first time in 21 years. It's like the lights went on. And I'm thinking, why did I waste all of this time? Proverbs chapter 15, verse 30. This is the last one of those verses in the string of pearls I want to mention is this. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. When you are looking at truth and you're walking in truth, the light of the eyes. Because the light is the mechanism, the scripture says, that brings truth into your life. When you are walking in the light, which is truth, and the light of your eyes is seeking truth, and you're walking in truth, here's what he's saying. It rejoices the heart. And a good report maketh even your bones to be fat. I tell, the, I tell my wife all the time, the reason I can't lose weight is I'm just so full of the Lord. It's making my bones fat. You know what she told me the other day? I don't care so much about your bones, but what about the rest of you? you listen, you, can need, you need to start taking care of yourself. We're getting up there. And, but listen, guys, listen to what Solomon is saying. There's much more than just what's on the surface. A merry heart. How do you get a merry heart? In his presence, his fullness of joy. I've had three of my pastor friends this last year and a half throw in a towel. So I don't want to do it anymore. 1,500 pastors every month in the United States quit the ministry never to go back. 4,000 churches this year will shut the doors never to open again. And you know why? They forgot the source of their joy. Because it's not in a building. It's not in a profession. It's not even in a calling. It's in His presence. And I will tell you, I, on the way to church, I stopped my pat in my little camper and I said, if it wasn't for you and you taking me away to be in the presence of the Lord, I'd have killed somebody a long time ago. <laughs> this is where I this is where my this is where my compass gets calibrated. This is where my heart goes on an altar. This is where the things that are deep in me get fixed. This is where the Lord speaks to me. In his presence, fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures evermore. 
And don't tell me we're only going to get, no, we're going to get through at least three verses. A merry heart can only be found when that heart is upon an altar and God is massaging it. A merry heart doth good like a medicine. Man, if you're depressed and discouraged, get alone with the Lord. And let him take that heart of stone out and put a heart of flesh in. And get out where, if you're, if you're like me, and you sing in our sharpened Z flat, get out where there's nobody around. Because who knows, the Lord might just get a hold of you, man, and you've got to, you, you know, Jesus said, if they hold their peace, even the rocks will cry out. And there was rocks all around me, and I didn't want them crying out, so I cried out. But a broken spirit. Didn't Jesus say he came to heal the brokenhearted? Didn't Jesus say he came to heal the broken? The only reason he can't heal the broken heart is you don't give him your heart. It's like dried up bones. Verse 23. A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom and he perverts the way of justice. Um, you can forgive me later, but I'm going to tell you in my Bible what I have written. A wicked politician, and especially the Democrats, they take bribes um, and they rip off from the heart of people to pervert justice. I look around today and I see what's going on. Somebody's bought. and They're bought and paid for and they've taken bribes. And they're not doing what's right. If you had the displeasure, and I, I did, I, I, do, I don't watch news anymore. I just watch snippets on YouTube of the what thing I want to see. And, and I wanted to see a snippet in, um, on, um, on Fox News of A.G. Barr, our attorney general, standing before the Congress. And what a show that was. Um, those people don't want to hear the truth. We're living in a time like that. And here Solomon would say that a wicked man, he takes a bribe. And then he perverts justice. But there's a day coming when the king of glory, the righteous king, will come and deal with them. Wisdom, and, and this reads a little funny in, in the old King James, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to put it in, in, a, in a, I'm going to try to frame it from the original autographs in a way that makes a little bit more sense. And this is what it's saying. Wisdom is in the sight of. It's not just before, it's in the sight of. In other words, somebody who seeks to be wise is looking at wisdom. That's what we're doing tonight. Because we're studying the book of wisdom. We're looking at it. We're looking into it. We're desiring to receive from it. Wisdom is before him or in the sight of him that hath understanding. We get understanding of how God wants us to behave, how God wants us to act, what he wants from us, what he's willing to give to us. We get that understanding as we study the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And when you glean that understanding, guess what? As you're beginning to navigate through this life, what God puts in front of you because you have understanding is wisdom. That's why I often say to you that, listen, the benefit of studying God's Word is not just in the instruction, it's in the application. Because as you begin to understand God's Word and you begin to be obedient to God's Word, as you begin to walk in His ways and walk in ways that are pleasing to Him, as you commit your life to Him and as you commit your life to follow Him, then what He puts in front of you is wisdom. You have discernment, you have insight. All of a sudden, things become very clear. Decisions you need to be make, you need to make, become very clear. God directs your path. It's the same thing that we studied back in chapter three of the same book. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will what? Direct your path. It's what He does. That's who He is. Wisdom is in the sight of Him that hath understanding. But in contrast, the eyes of a fool are in the ends of the earth. Now remember, there's four kinds of people Proverbs deals with. The simpleton, the one that's just immature and doesn't know yet. And we all start our Christian walk as simpletons. Very simple, don't we? 
We, all we knew, when I went home to witness my parents, all I knew is I was saved. And I think I knew one or two verses. But then we grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, and we become wise. The other two people in there are fools and scorners. A fool is one who doesn't listen. And then eventually he becomes a scorner, and a scorner is the one who mocks God's word. But here, Solomon is saying, and listen carefully because I, I want to unpack the last part, but the eyes of a fool, one who just doesn't listen, they're at the ends of the earth. In fact, there's a quote I want to give you by uh, a man named Ross. He's one of, one of my favorite um, commentators. I have a number of them. But Ross says this. He says, as a student who is hearing nothing of what the teacher says. Now, I need you to be careful, too, because sometimes you can sit in here because we teach through the Bible, and you can begin to, to just drift away. You know the difference between religion and relationship? Religion is when you sit in church and you think about fishing or camping or hunting or golfing. I don't know why you do that, but... But relationship is when you're camping and you're hunting and you're fishing and you're thinking about him. He's ever before your eyes. He's your master passion. And here, Ross would say, a student who is hearing nothing of what the teacher says might let his eyes rove to every corner of the classroom. So the fool, now he's making an application. So the fool who is inattentive to the instruction of wisdom is said to have his eyes on the ends of the earth. They're somewhere else. The fool does not understand the most important thing in his life is that he needs to gain understanding, and thus by gaining understanding, he will have wisdom so he can navigate through this life in a way that's pleasing to the Father so that he can be blessed. A fool, his eyes are just, his heart, his mind, everything wanders. He can't stay focused on the things of the Lord. Verse 25, a foolish son is the grief of his father and bitterness to his mother that bore him. And again, if the father does not step into that role and train up his children and correct and discipline them and disciple them to nurture and admonition, that not only will it be a heartbreak to him, but it will be bitterness to his mother because that child will just be wild. Um, verse 26, also to punish the just is not good. Um, and we're going to tell you why it's not good in a moment. Nor to strike princes for them exercising justice or exercising equity there means to exercise justice or to exercise what is right. God puts people in places of authority, just men, godly men, to exercise correction and discipline, whether it be in society. We can apply this to the police. Because doesn't Romans chapter 13 tell us that they are ministers of the Lord and they don't wield the sword in vain? That if you do what is right, you have no fear of the police officers? I was up today uh, getting my new CCW um, card and, and I, when I was there with the sheriffs, I said, I, I want to thank you guys for what you do. And they go, what? I said, I want to thank you for your service. And so in fact, you know, I pastor Gold Country Calvary Chapel and just um, the other morning we came here and there was two of your sheriffs parked in our parking lot, we want to thank you for doing that. You want to thank us for doing that? I said, absolutely, I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, because we used to have people come around here and vandalize things. They don't do that anymore when you guys are parked there. We, we thank you for that. And I said, as a matter of fact, we pray for you. You do what? He said, we pray for you. We know that what you do is ordained to the Lord because God wants there to be a civil society. And you guys are really ministers. They, what? And I said, well, before I leave here, I can ordain all of you guys if that's what you want. Oh, they sort of laugh, and I go, no, 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 that's what you are. And I want you to know I thank you because I can't imagine a world where there's lawlessness. And one of them said, well, it's looking like we're getting there. And I said, you're right. I said, be of good courage. I'm going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do. You keep doing what you're supposed to do. 
My job is to keep people on the moral highway moving at the right speed, and your job is to keep them on the lawful highway moving at the right speed. But here it says, he that punishes the just, you know, throwing frozen water bottles at the just, um, you know, doing all they can to disrupt, and then you have the politicians backing it up. You also have people in churches screaming at men who would stand up and dare tell them the truth. Do you know today the new hate language is truth? <laughs> you know, we get a lot of good emails from around the country and around the world, actually, thanking us for just teaching through the Bible. But we get a lot of ones that, I get a lot of ones that aren't, you know, when they start having a bunch of squiggly and, you know, set of letters, I start pushing the delete button on that email. Because people don't want to hear the truth. And if they don't like the truth, what we talked about Sunday morning is you kill the messenger if you don't like the message. Here Solomon says, those who punish the just for doing what is right, and they that strike, abuse princes, those that are put in places to execute what is right, that's not good because God is always on the side of justice and what is right. And you're not on the right side of the thing if you're against those things. Um, so that's why I'm, I, you know, I, I said something to a, well, there was a new couple here Sunday morning. And he came and he said, you know, I've been listening. And you said something about the Democrats. And I said, yeah, sometimes I, you know, I do that. And he goes, no, 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 you're absolutely right. And I said, well, what did I say about them this time? I had to ask. He said, well, you said that you didn't know how someone could be a Democrat and be a Christian. And I said, well, I don't. He said, I agree. I said, how can you be pro-abortion? Because that's idolatry. You're serving Moloch. How can you be um, pro-gay marriage? Very first thing God instituted was marriage between one man and one wife for one lifetime. And if you have any other opinion than that, you're wrong. And see what they're doing to our country. He said, I can't, I can't go along with that. And they are punishing people that are trying to do what's right. And God's against that. It's not good that they should do that. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 5, verse, um, do I have this one? Verses 3 through, uh, 3 and, well, First Timothy. Did I give him the right one? 1 Timothy 5, 17. Well, 1 Timothy 5, 17 says this. Don't put it up. We're getting close to the end of this day. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says this. Those who minister in the word are worthy of double honor. God says that. Because you have no idea the battle pastors are under today just to stand and speak the truth. I, I decided a long time ago what I was going to do. I don't care if there's 10 people or 10,000 people. It doesn't matter to me. My job is to stand and preach the truth. You know why? Because I don't do it for you. I love you. I'm going to do it for him. And this weekend he told me again, you keep doing what you're doing. Because if you don't, no, Lord, you got no problem here. In fact, I love your truth. And so the worthy of double honor, not punishing, not in any way. In fact, the Bible says you need to obey those who have rule over you because they watch out for your souls and do it in such a way that it's not grievous to them. You know, if, if you get hit, if you get hurt, if you get wounded, man, get over it. You know, I'm just up here. I'm just the mailman. I didn't write the letter. I'm just delivering it. Amen? Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. You're okay if you get hit. Right? Because God loves you. Those are love taps. Remember, he said he only, he, he only disciplines them that he loves. Uh, we're not going to be able to do another one. Okay, let's just do, no, we can't, because it's connected to the next one. And that's not going to work. I don't have time. Fathers. Fathers. Step up, man. Let me look, because our fathers do a good job here. Where's the camera? Oh, there it is. Fathers. I know the weight that's on you. We pray for you. Jesus step up. And you need to be get godly 
young men and young women. Amen? Our society would not be in the shape it is today and be taken that serious two generations ago. Amen? I thank God that I had a dad. Wasn't a believer. I got, to lead, I got the wonderful privilege of leading my dad to the Lord 17 years after I came to the faith. But my dad was a moral man. And he was a wise man. And he was a man that understood that, that, that he didn't want me to live like the world in rebellion. And so he disciplined me. And he disciplined me right. My dad being an engineer, he would lay it all out. This is the good. This is the bad. This is the reward. This is the punishment. This is what I want you to do. This is what I don't want you to do. Wrote it out. Just like my other father did. And then when I would be disobedient, he would take me into the room. Actually, he'd send me to the room. Let me sit there for a little bit. He'd walk in and say, what did I say? And I'd have to repeat it. Uh, did you break the rules? Yes, I did. Um, then what should I do? Because I knew what the punishment was. And after he would punish me, he would wrap his arms around me and he would hug me. And he'd say, son, I love you. I don't want you to end up like those kids across the street. There's a bunch of kids that lived across the street, didn't have a father, and they just ran amok. He said, I care about you. And this hurts me more than it hurts you. You just don't know. And I used to think, yeah, right. But I know now. Love people in your life enough to tell them the truth. Love people in your life enough to get involved in their lives. Uh, like I was just telling my son, and I'll close with this, because, you know, he said, I'm trying to get up to speed about being a youth pastor. It's been a while since I was a youth, and I'm just trying to figure out. And I said, son, here's the deal. Don't ever forget this. I'm giving you the best advice I could ever give you in ministry. People don't care what you know, son, until they know that you care. Just love those kids like our youth pastor is doing here. Just love them and earn the right to speak into their lives. Some of them will hear, some of them won't hear. Don't get discouraged about the ones who don't want to hear. Look for the one who wants to hear and pray for the one who has an ear to hear and pray for the others who don't. Our father loved us into a relationship with him, did he not? And then he got involved in our lives. Amen? Be that person. Let's have the worship team coming up for one last song. Let's all stand. I'm wondering what song they have. I'm not going to suggest tonight. I want to wait for, like everybody else, see what dessert we have. How many got convicted tonight? Just me? I'm the one. Marnie. Uh, <laughs> Maureen, I see her put her hand up like this. She scratched her head. That's how I do. Lord, Lord, you, did, you, know, you almost got me tonight. Now nah, you had me. Had me in the very beginning. Listen, be quick to repent. Stay in that place of the Lord's presence and of his blessing. And none of this stuff that's going on in this world will have the effect on you of depression and discouragement. It just won't. You need to know who you are in the presence of your Father. And once you know who you are in the presence of none of this other stuff matters. Because we're going to leave here soon anyway. Amen? And guess where we're going? To our Father's house. Guess what room we're going to inhabit in our Father's house? place where the kitchen table's at. I grew up in a home where everything happened around the kitchen table. How many grew up in a home like that? That's where I grew up. My Everything happened at the kitchen table. And one day we're going to be at our father's house and his kitchen table. Amen. Looking over the mezzanine going, man, I'm glad I'm saved. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Let it wash over us. Let it bring wisdom to us, Lord. Let it speak. Let it continue to speak to us throughout the week until those things, Lord, that went into our ears penetrate our hearts. And we would be the fathers we're supposed to be, and we'd be the people. We wouldn't be duplistic. We would not be hypocritical. Lord, teach us to walk in integrity 
because an integrity is where your presence is felt and your joy and peace is experienced. And we pray these things in Jesus' name tonight. And all God's kids would say, Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Father, I pray that your peace would rest upon your people. That, Lord, you would flood their hearts this week with joy that's inexpressible and that's full of glory, Father. Lord Jesus, that you would just wrap your loving arms around each and every one of them, Lord, with a great big bear hug like only Pastor Todd can give. And just whisper into their ears, man, you're my son, you're my daughter. I love you. I love you. Man, what I've got in store for you, don't look at the things going on around you. You're just passing through this. Soon and very soon, I'm coming back for you. May you do that for them this week, Lord. And Lord, for Maureen and Mike, for the Takeuchi family, we are so glad to see her, Father. I see her all the time on Facebook, but so glad to see her come down from Montana to be uh, here in California. <laughs> Lord, give her a safe trip back to Montana. Bless her, Lord, while she's here. Bless her family. And Lord, we thank you for her. We thank you for all of those. You know, it's, what a day it's going to be when we all get to gather around uh, your throne in heaven and worship you together with the realization we're never going to have to say goodbye again. No more parting. And we're just there with all of our loved ones. We're just there, Lord. We're the church and we're there with you, Father. Man, how glorious that's going to be. And so, Father, until that day, just keep us pressing on, pressing forward. Always looking upward, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's kids would say, amen, amen. amen. Hey, if you need prayer, we'll be up here to pray with you. We can't lay hands on you, but we can bump elbows with you. So if you need prayer, come on up.